mankind have been around for thousands and thousands of years and we've used ships to transport even to this day. 90% of the commerce in the world is transported by, by the oceans. Throughout the development of modern civilizations, despite the dangers, human beings have always crossed the oceans, taking their lives into their own hands. Until the mid 20th century, they didn't have very good ability to predict weather. And as a result, probably billions of dollars have been lost in the ocean just through shipping wealth on the oceans. How many ships have disappeared? And how much wealth has accumulated at the bottom of the ocean over the centuries? The deep is an El Dorado. There's more gold and silver in the Straits of Bahamas than there is in the Bank of Madrid. A new gold rush is emerging, a race in which treasure hunters rub shoulders with investors, constantly searching for new leads. How many shipwrecks? How many lost pages of our collective heritage? This is a very important heritage for all of us. Do not commercialize it, do not pillage it. Shipwrecks are becoming strategic and economic targets, and politicians now enter the race. Estas compañías de caza tesoro están arrasando. We have not seen one uh, case of a good treasure hunter. And as treasure hunters and so-called guardians of history clash, the shipwrecks themselves are in danger. In a matter of a few generations, the ancient hard drives of the past are being erased, and the legacy for future generations will be a flat line. Whether they are due to human error, a technical issue or to the weather conditions, accidents and maritime transport go hand in hand. We have to be humble with the sea. We don't win against the sea, we compose with the sea. A reality we only tend to address when an incident takes place near our shores or when a large cruise ship is affected. The other accidents remain in the shadows. If you look véritablement the things in the loop, you have 110, 120, 122 naufrages of big buildings of plus de 300 tonneaux per year. Ce qui veut dire, rapport au nombre de jours de l'année, vous avez un naufrage à peu près tous les trois jours sur la mer du globe. International expert in underwater archaeology. Michel Lour is head of DRASMA, the Department of Underwater Archaeological Research. For the past four decades, his missions have taken him to all of the planet's oceans. C'est par un bateau qu'on transporte le plus facilement des produits tondéreux et à longue distance. Donc, tout au long de l'histoire de l'humanité, dès qu'on a commencé à coloniser les espaces maritimes, on est monté sur des bateaux et chacun sait que dès qu'on se met sur un bateau, il y a un risque de naufrage. Ce que l'on sait, c'est que dans toutes les zones où nous travaillons, le fond de la mer est jonché d'épaves, et évidemment, d'autant plus dans les zones qui ont, qui ont connu un grand trafic maritime. Plus la belligérance en mer, les navires de guerre, etc. Il y a des épaves sur toute la planète. Food, fuel, consumer goods, and raw materials. 90% of all we consume is transported by sea. A fleet of 60,000 ships, the blood flow of global trade, transporting goods on shipping lanes outlined over the centuries. But how many vessels never made it to their destination? It's really hard to predict precisely how much ships is lost um, uh, in particular areas, uh, but you can get a sense of it if you start to think about who were the great colonial powers. When 
you consider that ships have been sinking for over 2,000 years, and if you say, okay, so is it reasonable to think about 1,000 ships a year are lost? I think it is. Recently, in an initiative to map the entire ocean floor, the 195 member states of UNESCO came together and published an estimation. Three million shipwrecks around the world. There might be many more, there might also be less, because it's very difficult to evaluate if they have actually survived. You know, I mean, if there's still something there. And many have gone down without having been ever noted down in any book. So three million, it's a good estimation, but there can be more, there can be less. Maybe more, maybe less. For many underwater archeologists, this number is a huge underestimate. We come up with these great theories on blackboards and in, in conference halls of three million shipwrecks, but the truth is nobody knows really how many shipwrecks are down there. We think we got 6,000 shipwrecks off the UK, but we know historically at least 37,000 ships were lost throughout history. So whatever figure we give you is going to be an understatement. Even though the oceans cover over 70% of our planet, less than 5% have been explored. So what's down there? I mean, humankind have been around for thousands and thousands of years. So I would think that there's at least that many wrecks down there and perhaps a lot more. We know nothing. However, the most shipwrecks in the world are still to be found. In my opinion, the most wrecks in the world lie in the South China Sea. A mythical crossing point between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, the Strait of Malacca, is the busiest shipping channel on the planet. And the port of Singapore is its nerve center. If we go back in history, everybody came here to trade. This was the center of commerce, where Europe was still sleeping in the Stone Age. It's here where British Captain Michael Hatcher made his first dives as a treasure hunter. I first came to Singapore in 73, and that's when I did the first salvage, or we could say treasure. Um, and then from that point on, I've been hooked ever since. Hatcher recovered steel from shipwrecks dating back to the Second World War, which he sold by weight to make a living. Until one day, he came across something other than steel. I didn't know nothing about porcelain. So I gathered up some pieces, took it to Christie's in Amsterdam, and Christie's are ringing me and ringing me so I eventually I go along and they pulled one cup up and they said to me, you any idea how much this cost? And I said, oh, maybe $5. And they said, what about 5,000? And I can remember I said to them, how many do you want? And they said to me, there is some more. The diver had unwittingly discovered the Nanking, a boat that sunk in 1750 after colliding with a coral reef, a veritable gold mine. There'd never been this amount of porcelain ever, ever discovered. In Amsterdam, they've been queuing round the block for hours on end just to glimpse the Nanking treasure was found 150 Immediately. What is now known as the Hatcher Porcelain, 
creates a storm. The volume and variety of porcelain up for sale is vast. There are complete dinner services with place settings for as many as 144. And the Nanking's cargo is auctioned off in Amsterdam. Well, I think we got um, 27,000 pieces. And they were all saying it's too much, it'll flood the market, it'll destroy. But it didn't. It, it put interest in the market. It opened up the history book of Chinese porcelain. 58, $58. The 27,000 pieces of Chinese porcelain are sold in just a few days to buyers from all over the world. A jackpot of nearly $10 million for Hatcher and his team. I'm absolutely amazed. Yeah, I can't believe it. Would I describe what I do as treasure hunting? I think that's the romantic name for it. I, I look at it as cargo recovery. Whether they consider themselves treasure hunters or cargo recoverers, many explorers enticed by Hatcher's story set sail and headed for the ocean deep, which according to experts still holds many surprises. Thousands of shipwrecks are gonna turn up with incredibly rich cargoes, and what you get are clusters of wealth. You wanna talk about the biggest concentrations in the world? You gotta to go to Havana, Cuba, where the great Spanish galleons used to converge. And there's a saying that there's more gold and silver in the Straits of Bahamas than there is in the Bank of Madrid. Gold. In Spain, the 16th century is fittingly named the Golden Age. For more than 150 years, the Spanish pillaged gold from the New World even ransacking tombs in the process. If you hold a gold bar, a silver coin, an emerald, or a pearl, you could say that actually you're just one degree of separation away from genocide. All these things started life in mines, in Colombia, in Mexico, in Peru, where thousands of slaves, Indians and Africans, were murdered for the sake of royal Spanish riches. These stolen treasures from the Americas were loaded onto large ships and transported to the island of Cuba. The galleons then gathered in convoys in the port of Havana to cross the Atlantic together. Ese tráfico naval tan grande tiene una media anual de de unas 4000 prácticamente 4000 embarcaciones entraban al puerto de La Habana. Hasta un punto que durante el siglo XVI y gran parte del XVII no es la villa de La Habana lo importante. Lo importante es el puerto, la bahía. Estamos hablando que en esos 150 años pasan por La Habana alrededor de eh, 200.000 kilogramos de oro y 16 millones o más de 16 millones de kilogramos de plata. More than 3,000 shipwrecks are lying around the island. But more than the sheer number of them, it is the estimated value of their cargo that turns the treasure hunters' heads. Cuba is a great example of a country that probably has huge potential to realize values. And, you know, we have a bunch of shipwrecks in our database uh, that were lost uh, in and around Cuba uh, that would have been transporting significant wealth, which is likely has value in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in an individual shipwreck. Four million tons of gold and silver shipped across the Atlantic. How can we know how much of this wealth is scattered along the ocean floors of some of the world's major shipping lanes? According to experts, 
the amount is dizzying. We have a database of over 10,000 shipwrecks. At least 100 of those shipwrecks have a value of $50 million or more. Some of those individually could be worth more than a billion dollars. So you start to get a sense of how many riches were lost uh, through accidents on the water over the past couple of thousand years that mankind has been transiting valuables over the sea. You know, based on the historic records and the data that I've seen, about a one-third of the gold, silver, and other precious mineral wealth of human beings has been lost at sea. The discovery of these shipwrecks represents the promise of a new vein, estimated in billions, something that has not escaped the nose of investors in precious metals gathered here in Zurich. Moi, je vois un gros richesse qui qui reste dans ces épaves. Ça ça représente une ressource de je crois que c'est 100 milliards. C'est sûr que 100 milliards c'est une ressource économique assez important. Alors c'est sûr et certain qu'on va voir un, un, un bon résultat si on continue à chercher ces épaves, les richesses qui étaient mises en place par les ancêtres. Shipwrecks filled with precious metals. A gold mine, perhaps. But the job is far from over. These shipwrecks still have to be located. It is here in Seville, where archaeologists, scientists, and treasure hunters unite under one roof. Existía una burocracia muy estricta. Cuando un barco se hundía y había algún superviviente, eh, se realizaban informes que se guardan en los archivos. En esos informes se detalla cuáles han sido las circunstancias, cuál era la climatología, cuáles son las condiciones que motivaron el naufragio. The General Archives of the Indies houses nine straight kilometers of valuable records listing all of the voyages of Spanish ships. 10% of these ships sank. But where exactly? At the time, GPS systems did not exist. Many ships left the New World and came back laden with um, gold and silver, and many sank. But there was very poor navigation data. And so for us, we would not be very interested in a research file that said, well, this ship left Havana in 1580, and somewhere between Havana and Spain it sank. That's not going to be of interest to us. So we have to have good navigation data to limit the size of the um, survey to make it cost effective. While maps and registers found from the period were unclear, technological advancements in recent years have now made it possible to fill in the gaps. Although a rather laborious task, finding the needle in the haystack is now possible. We develop a search box, and then um, our survey vessel will go to that area, and it will deploy our sonar gear, where we tow it on a cable behind the boat, and we just methodically map the seabed going back and forth until we either find the ship or we don't find it. In recent times, with the advents of uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, new robotic technology, sensor technology, the kind of stuff that we are building today, it's making it easier and more cost-effective for explorers. At the sonar level, we can see objects as small as in the centimeter level range, and with the laser, we can see things in the millimeter range. Photogrammetry now makes it possible to visually reconstruct the seabed. As the tools get better and better, technology keeps breaking down the barriers of the deep. Les limites de la plongée scientifique, ça tourne autour de 60, 70 mètres. On arriverait à réunir une équipe pluridisciplinaire. Au-delà, ça devient très illusoire. Et au-delà de 300 mètres, de toute façon, l'humain n'a plus sa place. Aujourd'hui, on est arrivé, je dirais, presque à la science-fiction du passé. Continue comme ça, Vincent. Il y a simplement 5-6 ans, on parlait de la profondeur. 
Et aujourd'hui, c'est devenu notre quotidien. We can now virtually go anywhere at the bottom of the sea, from 150 meters, which is the bottom of the sea in the English Channel, to 4,800 meters in the Atlantic. That's a mile deeper than the Titanic. So the future has arrived, the robots have arisen. Although the Titanic lies 3,800 meters underwater, the shipwreck was explored 20 years ago. However far down, shipwrecks are no longer out of reach of human greed. And the massive wealth they harbor is wetting government's appetites, which have also joined the treasure hunt. Hemos encontrado 307 años después de su hundimiento el Galeón San Jose. Finding the San Jose, a Spanish galleon sunk in 1708 by the British Navy off the coast of Cartagena, was a gamble taken by Juan Manuel Santos, then president of Colombia. In 2015, after years of research, his team located the galleon 300 meters below the surface off the coast of Colombia. On a affaire à un navire du roi d'Espagne qui transporte une cargaison extrêmement importante. On l'estime à 200 tonnes d'or plus une masse non négligeable, semble-t-il, d'émeraudes. Colombian emeralds, gold from the Peruvian mines, under the cannons and amphorae, 17 billion dollars worth of cargo, waiting patiently for the Colombian government. This is the largest treasure ever discovered. Le gouvernement de Colombie a d'une part annoncé qu'il avait l'intention de faire une fouille de cette épave qui soit euh, exemplaire. Proteger el patrimonio cultural de Colombia. En tout cas, le gouvernement dit je veux réunir la meilleure équipe du monde pour faire cette fouille et en même temps, euh, il se rapproche de chasseurs de trésors américains en leur disant il faudrait que vous réunissiez l'équipe. Donc là, il y a quand même un petit gap, pour ne pas dire plus, entre la prétention scientifique et de confier le dossier à des chasseurs d'épaves qui n'ont aucune vocation à faire de la recherche scientifique. Today, the San Jose and its treasure are still 300 meters underwater. The Colombian government is unable to finance the recovery operations by itself. It would have to appeal to private companies, paying for their services by offering them a portion of the cargo. A practice fiercely condemned by heritage protection organizations such as UNESCO. I think those states will come around after a while and see that this is not a good solution. We have not seen one uh, case of a good treasure hunter. In the best case, he makes a lot of money. In the worst case, not even. But he will finish with your heritage destroyed and certainly nothing in your hands. The funding of operations to recover sunken cargo is a real dilemma. A battle between, on the one hand, treasure hunters and their potential partners, and on the other, the guardians of maritime heritage. Digging the deep doesn't come cheap. Basically, if you want a large research ship that can launch a remotely operated vehicle, you're talking $35,000 a day, perhaps. If you want to go and salvage something like a World War II ship in 4,000 meters, add a zero to that. This is an expensive operation when you're working in the deep ocean. It can cost between one to three million dollars per month. Millions of dollars. This is the price of joining the treasure hunt. A price that only companies such as Odyssey Marine Exploration can afford. This listed company, based in Tampa, Florida, is one of the industry's heavyweights in the recovery of precious metals. Odyssey Marine Exploration has been in the ocean exploration business since 1994. And the focus for the first 15 or 20 years was almost exclusively to find uh, shipwrecks that had valuable cargo that could be salvaged and monetized. Odyssey has already hit the jackpot. In 2007, the corporation flew 17 tons of gold and silver in bars and coins into Tampa Airport. 
The hoard came from a Spanish frigate named Nuestra Señora de las Mercedes, which had sunk in 1804 off the coast of Portugal. Ils l'ont fouillé et ont ramené en Amérique pour 500 millions de dollars. En pièces d'argent, il y a quelque chose comme 590 000 pièces. The cargo of the Mercedes frigate is the greatest treasure ever surfaced. There's something about gold, especially when that sunlight hits the gold. It's just it's the permanence. <laughs> yeah. It took Odyssey 10 years to locate the shipwreck and surface the treasure a feat of technical achievement and the start of an unprecedented legal battle. Et ces gens s'empressent de faire valoir auprès du tribunal de Tampa en Floride leur droit à la propriété de l'épave. Espérant que de toute évidence, un juge américain va dire mais bien sûr messieurs, vous l'avez trouvé dans les eaux internationales, c'est à vous. Ça ne va pas se passer de façon aussi simple. What Odyssey has done is morally and legally unacceptable. The treasure hunters were required to return every single coin and other artifact they had taken. Spain finally claims the booty. The authorities in Madrid declare that the Mercedes frigate is historical heritage, referencing the boat's military character. El gobierno de España interpuso una querella ante los tribunales de Estados Unidos contra esta compañía de caza tesoros por entender que eran fragatas buques de Estado y que por tanto el barco y su contenido pertenecían a España. After a five-year-long trial, the U.S. Supreme Court sentences Odyssey to hand over the entire treasure to Spain. This decision is a first. It is based on the sovereign immunity principle in United States law, which considers that a military ship will always remain the property of whichever country's flag it flies. Inmediatamente, los aviones de la Fuerza Aérea del Ejército Español, acompañados por la Guardia Civil, fueron a Estados Unidos, recogieron el cargamento, las 600.000 monedas, y inmediatamente vinieron a España. This is historical heritage. This is not to be sold, this is to go to a museum, but we have to fight against those who go and salvage uh, uh, sunken uh, objects. Cazatesoros son personas de ese momento histórico, que si no se les pone coto muy firmemente y toda la opinión mundial les condena tan severamente como se condena a quien viole a un niño o a una niña, en apenas 10 años van a hacer desaparecer todo el patrimonio colectivo de los pecios de cualquier periodo colectivo de la historia. Estas compañías de caza tesoro están arrasando. The 600,000 coins are entrusted to the National Museum of Cartagena in Spain. The museum puts some on display and stores the rest in a vault. Salvaged almost 600,000 coins were, which were essentially identical, 600,000 of the same item keep a representative sample, which we do, photograph every single coin, front and back, so you have a permanent record, high-definition photograph. The case of the Mercedes frigate is symbolic of the war between those who recover the treasure, aiming for profit, and those wanting to preserve it. That's not cultural heritage. Those are trade goods. Those are items that were made and intended to be used in trade, and they're only not in the stream of commerce because they were lost by an accident. Make 590,000 of those 600,000 available to collectors who would buy them, and then let the country enjoy the economic benefit that results from it. Efectivamente, querido amigo, las 600.000 monedas de la fragata Mercedes u otras de otros buques españoles o franceses, si se venden, da mucho dinero. Yo les sugiero que vendan ustedes todos los cuadros que hay en el Louvre, empezando por la Yoconda. Propongo que de las ocho columnas que tiene el templo de la Madeleine, que consigue Napoleón, se vendan siete porque están repetidas. Los capiteles son idénticos. Por favor, es una discusión in impensable en un museo nacional. 
sur les autres. Bon, là, on peut le faire d'ailleurs sur tout. Je n'ai pas besoin de 10 plats de porcelaine de Chine très similaires ou identiques. Je vous en gardez un, j'en vends le reste, etc. Et donc, on voit bien que cette machine, ce raisonnement, et ça, partout, ça a été appliqué, c'est parti dans des déviances. Quand on sait que c'est une opération commerciale, en disant on va préserver un pan de l'histoire, en réalité, ce pan de l'histoire se réduit à la portion congrue, c'est-à-dire la portion qui n'a aucune valeur, qui est la moins intéressante, la plus abîmée, et tout le reste est négocié parce que ça a une valeur. If treasure hunters are the only ones able to access these shipwrecks, how to ensure that they will not destroy objects with no commercial value in order to optimize their costs and recover as many valuable goods as possible in the least amount of time? According to them, the position taken by archaeologists and heritage protection organizations is unrealistic. The academic community, which oftentimes influences government policy, uh, is, is very opposed to a commercial model. Uh, the preference uh, is worldwide uh, seems to be to leave things be. The United Nations, UNESCO, the group in the United Nations that regulates this, has a preference for leaving things in situ, leave them there. Once they ended up there, leave them there. Odyssey along with most other treasure hunting organizations, base this belief on one paragraph of the UNESCO Convention. It is written in black and white that in situ preservation must be a priority. According to them, this convention prevents any sort of exploitation. It's totally false. La UNESCO en ningún momento dice que los objetos tienen que quedarse en el fondo del mar. La UNESCO dice sin tener ni los conocimientos técnicos, ni los medios, ni la capacidad de investigación. La primera opción es dejarlo in situ, formar un equipo científico, disponer de los medios técnicos, tener el dinero suficiente, tener los laboratorios de conservación y restauración. Y una vez que esto ocurra, Los objetos y los yacimientos se excavan y se sacan. The convention says, leave the underwater culture heritage in place if you don't have a good plan what you actually want to do. Today, recovering sunken cargo is possible, but it must be carried out according to a preservation protocol, supervised and controlled by UNESCO archaeologists. And once brought to the surface, Nothing can be sold. Since people can actually go into the water, that's not so long yet, they have been looking for treasures and have been taking them out, you know, spreading them over the markets. A lot of things have been lost. To preserve this heritage for the future, for everyone, for humanity, this is a very important heritage, underwater culture heritage. All the traces uh, that humanity left in the oceans, protect it, preserve it. Uh, do not commercialize it, do not pillage it, ethical principles. The problem with that view is who's going to pay for that, right? Um, are the taxpayers, I mean, there are, everyone has bigger needs, uh, candidly, everywhere in the world uh, than going out and bringing this cultural heritage. But countries around the world have much more pressing issues that they have to fund. Uh, than spending money on shipwreck recoveries where we're bringing cultural heritage back to the light of day. Uh, but I really do think there's a, a model where there could be a commercial aspect to what happens and all of the archaeology, all of the history, and all of the academic knowledge can also simultaneously be preserved and presented. Another shipwreck recently discovered by Odyssey showed that collaboration between private companies and the public sector could prove to be a win-win situation. This is the case of the SS Gersopa. Odyssey had a contract with the British government to recover silver from something called the SS Gersopa. This was uh, an English merchant vessel that was sailing in 1941. The Gesopa was traveling from India to the UK with some 110 tons of silver on it. 
and it was going to the London Mint because we were running out of coinage during wartime and it was desperately needing to prop up the war economy. Not far from the Irish coast, the SS Garisoba ran out of fuel. Forced to abandon the convoy that was protecting it, the ship was torpedoed and sunk by a German submarine on February 17, 1941. The shipwreck was located in 2011, 4,800 meters underwater. Thanks to an unprecedented technological feat, Odyssey, commissioned by the British government, managed to recover over 60 tons of silver. The silver was found. It was brought up from 4,800 meters deep. That's a mile deeper than the Titanic. And it was melted down, and the UK government got their split, and Odyssey got their percentage. 3,000 silver bars, worth a total of $210 million. The jackpot is shared between Odyssey and the British Treasury, but the story doesn't end there. But then towards the end of the project, this sludge appeared up with the silver, and I was approached and brought into the team and said, what can we do with this? So because they had the funds from the silver, we could take the sludge to a laboratory, get it conserved, get it analyzed, and out of this probable situation and from the darkness, we now have 600 personal letters. And Christmas cards and business documents and checks being sent by mostly British army officers, their wives, missionaries, teachers in the British Raj being sent home at the end of 1940 to their loved ones. It's kind of a cross-section, a snapshot of the life of British India from the front line to the fireplace. And so society will contribute it. They'll learn the story, the real story about the SS Gersopa. And it gives you a kind of indication of the good that can be done um, if you allow a commercial angle, potentially, into thinking about how you're going to pay for this science. But it's only the fact that there was a commercial model that allowed us to roll out the science. Public and private cooperations have also proved successful in certain Southeast Asian countries, such as Indonesia and Malaysia where treasure hunters traditionally share their findings with the government. When I became involved in this work, I was dealing with Indonesia, I was dealing with Vietnam, Malaysia, and all of those countries had the policy of working with a private company. And then the rule was 50% went to the government, 50% to the salvage company, and they would keep representative collections for their museum but the bulk of it, the multi-duplicates, could be, still go for sale. These agreements allow governments to fund future shipwreck research and enrich their museums without incurring exploration costs. Although the process is risky for wreck hunters, their share of the treasure allows them to finance these excavations. So they work on a joint venture basis with private companies that are willing to spend the money and take the risk, because the risks are very, very high. Uh, and one of those risks is a political risk. You might have a nice contract with the government and you might bring up everything and do the conservation and then the government might say thank you very much and keep the whole lot. That's not unheard of. Unfortunately, due to some wreck hunters abusing these agreements, accused of not declaring large portions of their treasure, the Indonesian government made the decision to stop issuing exploration licenses. But alas, this has had unexpected negative consequences. So over time, the policies have changed. So in 2010, Indonesia actually put a moratorium on giving out license. Now all that has done is just open the field to the looters. So now there's a, a massive amount of looting going on. For local fishermen, recovering some porcelain plates and selling them for a handful of dollars has become just another source of income. They're not exactly wealthy. They need to feed their family. 
So the temptation is remarkable. They're going to go down there and, and loot the ship, and they don't have a choice. Anymore. So what's happening? All the shipwrecks are being blitzed and destroyed and dynamited by fishermen in the search for treasure and material to sell. Over just a few years, the black market has developed and Indonesia has become the world capital of underwater antiquities trafficking. Quand quelqu'un nous envoie des photos en disant tiens j'ai vu ça, on me l'a proposé à la vente, on le voit donc il y a nécessairement s'il y a le produit à la vente, c'est qu'il y a un pillage et un trafic. Très difficile malheureusement d'en estimer l'importance. This smuggling has resulted in the destruction of hundreds of shipwrecks feeding money into criminal organizations. These buy whatever the fishermen collect and then sell porcelain and other relics at high prices to unscrupulous collectors. Once on the market, the origin of these items becomes undetectable. C'est l'UNESCO, chacun le sait, n'a pas les moyens financiers de faire la police de toutes les épaves maritimes du monde. D'ailleurs, comment protéger toutes les épaves ou qu'elles soient dans le monde Il faudrait mettre un mirador avec un gendarme sur sur chacune d'entre elles. ¿Cómo se puede proteger? Ahí no hay, no hay más que dos vías. La protección activa, que es con las fuerzas de policía y las fuerzas de las armadas nacionales, y la protección pasiva, que es instalar en el fondo del mar o bien los sistemas de grandes cofres, lo que llamamos caja fuerte, de strongbox, eh, o de enrejados metálicos que impidan a los cazatesoros que penetren. En, cualquier, en el segundo de los casos es muy complicado si hablamos de aguas profundas. UNESCO has put protective measures in place in some archaeological sites. But these measures do not make a lot of difference. They only protect known shipwrecks whose cargo has already been emptied. Off Sicily, they're putting underwater video reconnaissance units on Roman and Punic shipwrecks so that they can map and watch out for trawlers coming into the area. But that costs 150,000 euros to set up and 15,000 euros every year just for maintenance. Who's going to pay that? While institutions and treasure hunters refuse to cooperate, some shipwrecks are becoming the object of geopolitical battles. In these cases, the treasure is not so much what the wreck contains, but where it is located. L'épave a été très longtemps appréhendée comme une page d'histoire euh, immergée de l'humanité qui méritait d'être protégée, étudiée, valorisée. Et puis tout d'un coup, l'épave peut encore avoir une autre valeur. C'est euh, comme si on avait planté un pavillon sur la banquise en disant le pôle Nord est à moi parce que j'y ai mis mon drapeau. For several decades, Canada funded the search for two shipwrecks, the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror, both of which disappeared in 1845. The purpose of John Franklin's expedition was to connect the Atlantic to the Pacific via northern Canada. The mission came to a halt when the two ships were crushed by the ice. The shipwrecks went down. Nobody knew where they were. There were various echoes and rumors from the local Inuit tribes. But recently, in the last few years, the Canadians, they found two of the most iconic shipwrecks, HMS Erebus and HMS Terra. And we had just passed uh, right over top of this wreck structure, uh, which just on, uh, uh, I think we could tell exactly what it was uh, in a few seconds. It's definitely, definitely a shipwreck. What was that. the reaction like? <laughs> Winning the Stanley Cup. <laughs> now that might sound like just great fun, Indiana Jones kind of exploitation, but Prime Minister Harper made it one of his driving missions to find the remains of these noble shipwrecks. It is about more than solving an age-old Canadian, British, world mystery. Canada had already put an X marks a spot. This is where the shipwrecks are and we own this area. We are demonstrating our absolute sovereignty over this piece of iconic territory. But sovereignty over this maritime area is not clear cut. Countries such as the United States consider the shipping lane as an international strait with open access. 
Yet the Canadian government sees this strategic crossing as an integral part of its internal waters. This is one of the two most important geopolitical hotspots in the world, along with the South China Sea. Now, America and other countries, they claim the Northwest Passage as an international waterway. The discovery of these shipwrecks is now an additional point of contention for the Canadian government. By controlling this passage, which reduces the distance between the North Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean by one third, Canada would have the right to impose its tariffs on all ships crossing the Northwest Passage. Canada says it's one of its own internal seas and it can control it and the freight and the cost of ships going all the way into the Far East, shaving weeks and months of sea voyages. As global warming heats up the planet, these icebergs are melting away. And for the first time, it's a practical reality that you will be able to sail. And indeed, it has been done through the Northwest Passage. Uh, but at the same time, it's gonna open up the area's islands. And these islands are incredibly rich. There's an iron mine there, which if it gets working, will pump billions into the Canadian economy. Billions of dollars, not to mention the potential oil and natural gas reserves reserves that are practically unexploited, accounting for 15 and 30% of the world's resources, respectively. So the search for the Franklin expedition ends up not being just about underwater exploration, but also being about huge business as well. Whether coveted for their cargo or for their strategic position, shipwrecks are now a major prize. These vestiges of the past lay nowadays at the heart of a deep water conflict. And whilst the gap between the different sides widens, far below the surface, these shipwrecks are at the mercy of the passing of time. Over time, everything that's sitting on the bottom of the ocean is going to degrade into nothing. The artifacts, the ship itself, uh, the cargoes, generally over time are going to be dissolved or degraded by the, um, the ocean environment until there really is nothing there to discover. Ocean acidification, the leading cause of the disappearance of coral reefs and numerous marine species, is gradually eroding these shipwrecks. And there is another threat, fishing, and in particular, deep sea trawling. I've argued that bottom trawling is the greatest threat to marine archeology span today. Some countries are campaigning to protect 30% of the world's oceans from industrial fishing through the creation of large marine reserves. Nous on a vu revenir des, des morceaux d'épave euh, tractés par des chaluts qui passent à 1500, 1800 mètres de fond. Ça en dit long. Et pratiquement dans la zone 300, 700 mètres, dans les zones où il y a du chalutage, quasiment je dirais euh, 8 épaves sur 10 sont ensachées dans des chaluts. Every year, fishing trawlers rake over seabeds the size of the Congo, India and Brazil combined. If a trawler goes through a shipwreck, it's destroyed. The damage is permanent, it is forever. Nowadays, deep sea trawling is a common global technique. A year of deep sea fishing has 800 times more impact on the seabed than traditional fishing. But how can we reduce the impact? of an industry in such high demand. Fishing brings in some $93 billion every year and employs 45 million people. Fishing is massive business. When we look at this United Nations law of the sea, that they're protecting these shipwrecks. Now we have massive trawlers in maybe a hundred years time, they'll all be destroyed because of the technicality advancement of, of the fishing vessels. If we add to deep sea fishing, the impact of offshore gas and oil exploration, as well as the proliferation of underwater cables, 
In 30 years, all of the world's shipwrecks will have disappeared. Toutes ces épaves, c'est des thrillers, c'est des livres policiers. Si vous commencez à en arracher une page, toutes les cinq ou sept pages, quand vous arrivez à la fin du livre, vous ne comprendrez plus rien à l'intrigue. Donc protéger toutes les pages, c'est la seule manière de comprendre la fin du roman. It's very important, you know, to protect and research this heritage but then also to give it to the public and say, this is something that you should appreciate, that is yours, and, uh, you know, protect it because it is yours. Who's going to pay that? We have to be realistic. We have to have robust models. And I'm not saying the commercial model of selling fines is the right model, but everything has to be on the table and we have to think creatively. The only way that really it can be done is to work with the government, which we are endeavoring to do and are doing, that, that pieces will be preserved. It will go for all our, for humanity, for everyone. If we just block it, it's lost. It's going to be lost. Will we finally open our eyes? and save the shipwrecks from their predicted disappearance? Will institutions such as UNESCO, archeologists and treasure hunters remain unshifting in their views? Or will they start talking to one another and work together to solve one of the greatest cultural challenges of this century? <laughs>